all right, I guess that's my cue. They told me that the house lights would go down and they told me the music would fade out. So that has happened. It's quite cozy in here. It's the last session of the day. So I hope you had a great day so far. Let's keep it lighthearted. Let's keep it entertaining. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to pass along a little bit of knowledge, but I won't be that arrogant. We'll see how we fare. It's always great to be in London and uh, thank you to the NDC crew for inviting me over. This is my second NDC event and uh, it's a pleasure. I hope I'm in the circle now and I can get selected for other events, but we'll see about that. So this presentation is about load testing with K6 and there's this emphasis on distributed load testing, but you'll have to bear with me. It, it'll happen near the end. So first I need to do the groundwork, explain a bunch of things. Honestly, I don't think I need an hour. Uh, I, I will press the button and my counter will go, so I'll keep a close eye on that, but maybe we'll be done earlier. That being said, let's make this work. There we go. Hi, my name is Thais. Yes, that's how you pronounce that. Uh, I'm from Belgium, Dutch-speaking Belgium, and I'm the tech evangelist at a company called Varnish Software. Now, uh, by show of hands, who's heard of Varnish Software before? A couple, a couple. I call that room for improvement. So uh, the people who do know us, who have heard about us, know that we're the company behind a very popular open source cache called Varnish Cache. And as an evangelist, I advocate uh, all of that, but I won't be doing that today. But before I can actually talk about the topic at hand, I need to, again, lay the foundations. And I want to introduce what we do, and that will help us contextualize where we're heading in this presentation. So we're a company that cares about caching, about web acceleration, about content delivery, and our open source product is used by about 10 million active websites, representing 22% of the top 10,000 websites. If you follow the timeline, which we won't focus on too much, is it all started from a, an open source project, and it led to us creating a commercial entity that spun out of an, uh, an open source uh, consultancy company out of Norway, and here we are now where I spend most of my time talking about content delivery, talking about web acceleration, about edge compute, but primarily within an enterprise context. So if you ask us what we do, yes, yes, we make the web faster. That's our bread and butter. That's, that's what we do. However, we also enhance digital experiences by lowering network latency. And that's pretty much our play on private content delivery. That's the world I work in, the world I live in. So the exact definition is we are a company that builds software-defined web acceleration and content delivery solutions. Strong emphasis on software defined. And our claim to fame, it's, a, it's, it's not a stat that we figured out, it's not a benchmark we have done, it's actually Intel who benchmarked us. So I think it's exactly a year ago at Mobile Worldcon in Barcelona, they introduced a new set of uh, new generation of CPUs. And in the build-up phase of that release, they did a bunch of tests and they added our stuff to the mix to see how far we could drive it, purely based on software, no hardware acceleration, on Pretty big stack, pretty big rig, but it was commercial of the shelf. You can buy this. And we ended up at 1.3 terabits per second on a single machine of throughput. Again, purely software-based, which apparently currently is a world record. We'll see. Uh, there's definitely someone who will come out of the woodwork and overtake us. Fully aware of that. The more important number is the one on the right-hand side. To achieve this, we got our energy consumption down to 1.17 gigabits per second on a single watt. So from an efficiency, sustainability point of view. That's really great. And that's where we start. That's the world I live in. Uh, you can reach me if you want to on a variety of social media platforms. I'm at Tay Surin everywhere. I deliberately kept the bird to <laughs> continue to do so uh, going forward. I'm the author of uh, an old book, Getting Started with Varnish Cash. Uh, I have a new one, a newer one that's my COVID work, uh, Varnish 6 by example. Uh, you can download a copy for free. Uh, Normally I bring physical copies, but this is, again, not a presentation about varnish. This is about K6, this is about load testing. So how do we end up from all of that intro, like talking about caching, talking about web acceleration, content delivery, how do we end up with load testing? Well, the answer is, if you're dealing with things at such a scale, you obviously need to give the system a run for its money. If you wanna make those claims, those benchmarks, you have to have tools to do so. Now, we didn't use K6, for the 1.3 terabits per second. We used a tool called WRK, or at least Intel did when they did the benchmarks, but I had a different situation. So in 2022, the fall of 2022, I was on a world tour, an actual world tour. So I was on Slack and my boss asked me, hey Taze, do you feel comfortable doing that product demo again that you've did a while ago? I was like, yes, was like very short, yes, sure, why? And then in, in, in very straightforward terms, he said, have you ever traveled the world? And 
one thing led to the other. Took the show on the road. I wanted to show how to build a private CDN using nothing more than software on a pretty basic AWS stack. And I wanted to generate some traffic on there. I needed a load testing tool to ensure that people saw that we didn't do Mickey Mouse numbers. And I was in a meeting with a colleague and he said, why not try K6? K6 is a pretty awesome tool. I'd never heard of it. So I went to the website, looked for it. I was presently surprised. Apparently it's a tool built by the lovely people at Grafana Labs and it has some cool capabilities. Capabilities such as the fact that everything is written in CLI tools. I mean, we all love CLI tools, right? Like, have you ever tried, have you ever had to convince a non-tech person that CLIs are way faster than GUIs? Like, I had to do that. And he's like, no, but you can take the mouse and you can click it real fast. I'm like, no, CLIs, trust me. I, I guess there's consensus here. I shouldn't over-dramatize that fact. We know if there's a CLI tool, and even better, if the CLI tool can be used to execute something that is scripted, wow, we're taking it to the next level. Now, the scripting, happens in JavaScript. Different variations of JavaScript, you can define the scenarios. And there's modules and you can define checks and metrics and thresholds and all that nice kind of stuff. And throughout, you can make it even more advanced by passing along parameters, by tuning things, by defining scenarios. Something that is out of scope for this presentation is the test builders, the browser recorders, and the browser testing. Maybe at some point I'll make a dedicated presentation about that, but there's only so much you could talk about. And in the end, and, and that's really important, we'll also talk about result storage and visualization integrations. A key feature that everyone should be excited about is the fact that you can write all your performance tests in some variation of JavaScript. Am I a JavaScript fan? No. Do I believe that JavaScript is the best language in the world? No. But it is the language of the people. Maybe that's, is that the right description? It is the lingua franca. The fact that I'm speaking English to you and not my native language, Dutch, means that English is more popular than Dutch. And I think that applies to JavaScript as well. You can hate on JavaScript, but a lot of people know it and there's a lot of support for it. So that's why we need to be excited about that. You wanna see some code, right? I've been babbling about JavaScript and the fact that it's there and you can use it. Well, here you go. Here is the simplest form of HTTP execution you can do in here. Very straightforward. Now, uh, Again, slides will be online later, you could steal that code. And uh, interestingly enough, that test.k6.io, that actually works. So the people at k6 provide these online testing tools that you can, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous, right? So everyone can play around with that and everyone will push that to the max. Like send boatloads, I was about to use another word, boatloads of, uh, of traffic in that direction and it still survives. So it's, a, it's pretty neat and you should try it. Now, you define a script, and I mentioned these CLI tools. How do you perform the execution? Well, the execution happens threefold. It all happens with the K6 binary, but there are subcommands. Subcommands to run local runs that will consume resources on your system to get the job done. You can run it in the cloud, which is their commercial product, which is nothing more than a trigger to a bunch of machines online that will do the work for you. And via Kubernetes, if you want to use some level of automated orchestration, and so on. So if you're interested in running it locally, it's, it's nothing more than K6 run, run your script, and you're done. Very easy, very straightforward. For cloud, obviously, you do K6 cloud script.js, and things will happen. But again, I won't be talking about the commercial product. And of course, for Kubernetes, it's writing this custom thing. Of course, there is dependencies. You need to install these custom types that you can then use to define a level of parallelism and you can use kubectl apply, run that YAML file, and you're good to go. I am, although this is very reasonable for distributed testing, I'm gonna focus on just running it locally, and we'll be doing distributed testing throughout. Bear with me. So when you run the script, obviously you need to get some results. Those are the three things we need. We need the script to define the scenarios, we need something to execute it, and then we need results. Here's the result. Now, uh, I'm not sure how readable this is from the back. So I'll be doing you a favor, I'll be zooming in every now and then with the data that matters. So this is all based on that initial script you saw, nothing more than an HTTP call to that test K6IO. And we didn't provide any parameters and it just ran out of the box. And what you see here is that we sent 17 kilobytes or, or at least 442 bytes and received 17 kilobytes and we made exactly one HTTP call, just one. It's not really representative of load testing, is it? Like, oh, great, we ran it at 2.8 requests a second. Wonderful. No, that doesn't prove a single thing. 
That's why we need to ramp it up. We need to scale up the tests, and there's a couple of ways of doing that. One that I use a lot is just using runtime parameters or command line options and arguments. Minus u means the number of virtual users, and minus d is the duration. So we're running for a minute long, running the script, doing as many iterations as possible, using 100 users. Each user, when it runs the execution flow, it will run it again and again and again until we reach that minute. So every virtual user can run multiple iterations, and you can see that in the output. You can also make it a lot more portable and put that in the options uh, data structure. And that's that. It's not really hard, very straightforward. But there is something I need to explain. I'm not really, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a mat mathematician. I mean, I'm a tech evangelist, which is pretty much a glorified marketeer. I'm not, not an engineer of any kind. I do have an engineering degree. However, I'm going to use a fancy term here. This is representative of the CAP theorem. This is just something I heard at another conference that I'm just repeating. CAP theorem states that you could choose two out of three and the third one's a variable. So you can make two of these values constant and the third will always be the variable. So in terms of the things we have, we have the virtual users, we have the concept of time, and we have the number of iterations that we want to achieve. So let's say we focus on iterations and time, we want to do X amount of iterations, we want to guarantee that in X amount of time, well, what the variable is, is, is the amount of virtual users you need to get that done. That's it. If you want to guarantee the number of iterations and guarantee the number of virtual users, well, the variable is time. And of course, virtual users and time, if you set that, the number of iterations will be variable. So you can only choose two, the third one is, is variable. Keep that in mind and we'll, we'll see about that when we talk about execution scenarios. But let's, again, we're dealing with the foundational elements, let's talk about these HTTP requests that are part of the stack. Here, again, our most basic of examples. How does it work? How can you expand on this? Because this is not really that useful and it doesn't really mimic a real life scenario. Does this mimic a real life scenario? No, it doesn't, but I just wanted to show you that you can run loops. So this doesn't qualify as multiple iterations. This is still a single iteration. However, you run multiple HTTP requests in that iteration. And I wanted to show you the syntax of the backticks and the variable interpolation. It's quite nice. You, you can do that kind of stuff. You can also add a number of parameters, parameters that you can inject as an argument in your HTTP get function, such as cookies and headers and a lot of other things like initially the cookies, but you can also set a cookie jar, meaning that if some system does a set cookie, it will store that state and will present it again upon subsequent requests. So we can have a stateful chain of, of requests. Headers you've seen, you can do authentication and redirects and tags and timeouts and compressions and everything that the lovely protocol of HTTP supports, which means going beyond get. You can do a post as well. You can provide your regular key equals value ampersand uh, syntax to post values to, to the service, which again, actually works. If you want to, you can test this, this should be working. If you want to go and take it or ramp it up a notch, you can go for JSON and use the json.stringify uh, function to actually turn a native JavaScript data structure, a JSON data structure into the stringified version. And you can post it and you can put headers in it. You can actually mimic the use of, of a post call for an API. But again, there's more, there's get, there's head, but here's the complete API, get, head, post, delete, patch and put, and options, which represents your RESTful stack of, of, of tools you're gonna to use. But there's also the more abstract HTTP.requests, which allows you to inject the request method you wanna use ad hoc at runtime. And you can also batch multiple ones together. So there will be multiple TCP connections doing stuff at the same time. And we'll do that now. Here you go, you can do a batch, and the batch can take an array of strings, as you can see here, that's my notation with get as request method, and then the URL we're gonna call. You can use objects of, or an array of objects, there's different notations here. And when we run it, you'll have multiple responses, an array of responses showing what the result was and getting metrics from it for each one of them. I do it in a manual way and I get response zero, and we're doing a check on it, checking whether the response status code is 200. And by doing this, I'm introducing you to a new concept, the concept of checks. Pretty straightforward, right? You probably know based on, on, on what you see here what a check is. A check will have a name, response code was 200. There's this injection of a value, 
which is res coming from the HTTP get containing the HTTP response. And we're doing an assertion, and the assertion is res.status should be 200 for just check to succeed. The literal API for this check function that performs checks goes as follows. But what is interesting about it that caught me off guard is when a check fails, it doesn't stop the execution of K6. It just keeps on running. However, it marks the failure as a metric. So even though the status code wasn't 200, you can keep track of that. So again, you can use this and check if there's a 301 or a 404 or 500, you can keep track of that. And you can actually stack them and say, hey, we want to keep track of the 200 status codes, but we also want to ensure that the protocol is HTTP2 and not HTTP1, and so on and so forth. Here's the result for that initial check, checking whether it's 200. Again, I'll do you a favor and zoom in. So first things first, you see in green, green check mark. For every check you do, there will be either a green check mark or a red cross with, with text in red. And what makes it a lot more fun is that now we have a checks metric that we keep track of. It's at 100% because all of them were successful. One of one was successful. And then you see the opposite happening. So in the end, we did two requests and the expected or the rec failed, failed. So the failure failed, you know what I mean with that, right? Everything was successful, so the failures failed. You can see that stuff happening. Now, of course, when we explicitly perform or, or trigger a failure, then you will see this happening. Zooming in, and uh, I shouldn't really be dragging this along <laughs> for a couple of minutes, right? This is pretty plain, uh, straightforward, pretty plain and simple. But what I do want to present to you is something that is similar to checks, but that does stop the execution, and that is thresholds. By defining thresholds, you can uh, state what your expectations are, and when those expectations are not met, the execution is halt it immediately. So the threshold here, again, in that options data structure, where we're storing uh, plenty of stuff, we are saying that uh, the HTTP request failure rate should be lower than 1%. If the rate's higher or equal to 1%, then we're stopping the execution immediately. Another thing we're doing is we're checking the duration of the request and expect the 95th percentile of requests to be lower than 200 milliseconds. And we perform the call, we do a test, K6IO, we sleep for a second, and that runs and runs and runs. When we run it, uh, well, I say it runs and runs and runs, I didn't provide any parameters, so it only gets executed once, but you can see the green check marks here. So the request duration was met, all good, and the failure rate was also met. No problem, everything's fine. We can change it and put the 95th percentile of the request duration to 90 milliseconds, and then things will change, of course. It will stop execution immediately. At the bottom of the screen, you see the warning there. And uh, there's obviously a lot more than fits on the screen, so let's do a little bit of a hack and move it up a bit, and then you can see why it failed, because the 95th percentile was at 100 milliseconds. So that's what you can do. You have checks on the one hand and thresholds on the other hand. You can combine them and get the stuff done and measure the stuff that you want to measure. You can also have multiple measuring points for a single duration if you want to. So 90 percentile, 90 fifth. You can even define 99.9 .9 percentile. So all these metrics uh, define the ranges within we measure things. All right, that was that. So we had checks, we had thresholds. Let's go to the next concept, which is tags. We all know tags. Tags are there to categorize things. We can categorize checks, thresholds, metrics, and even requests individually. So there are system tags that you can pull from immediately, all of these. We're not really interested in these tags. There's a way of defining our own tags if we want to. So the way I did this, and I think it requires a little bit more context into my original use case, is I wanted to do distributed testing. So I had multiple K6 nodes, one in Singapore, one in San Francisco, and one in Dublin. So they were geographically distributed. But I want to ensure that the script, which is identical on each of these nodes, is aware of its location. So what you could do is say tags location EU versus tags location US, versus tags location SG for Singapore. Of course, you can also do that on a more global level, not because here it's on the individual HTTP get, and maybe another HTTP get has a different tag. You can globalize that if you want to by specifying it at the options level. But the way I prefer doing it in order not to change the source code is injected via a command line argument. So you can do minus minus tag and then specify whatever tag you want. 
This requires altering the script slightly. So this is what the script now looks like. We've introduced a new function called the setup function. And that setup function then assigns a default value to the location, EU is standard. And then whatever comes in from the exec vu.tags tags, and then it's sort of a, uh, an array or, or a hash with location as the key, and then whatever value that is gets assigned. And what I'm doing here to make it a little bit more fun is I'm using that location because whatever gets returned from the setup function comes in as a dependency, sort of a dependency injection pattern into your regular default function. So I can alter the URL I'm calling based on a tag that was externally injected. It gives you a level of flexibility in terms of the execution. And then you can use those tags if you want to to define separate thresholds. Maybe your US servers are expected to be a bit faster than your EU servers and so on and so forth. Checks, yes. Thresholds, yes. Tags, yes. One more, groups. Groups are also there, also a key concept for categorizing things. What I'm doing here in this example is I'm creating a group for similar HTTP requests. I'm calling this group get, and it only does the get calls. It groups them, and it has the execution of the HTTP requests, and it has the checks and all the bells and whistles. And then, of course, we have another group, which is post, containing all the post requests, grouping them separately as well. The group name that you define will eventually become a tag in your results. So knowing tags from the previous examples, it shouldn't come as a surprise to see this. So we have the main, this is hierarchical, the main group name, which is a tag called get, and then we have the checks that are part of that tag that you can see there, and then the check is, uh, everything su is successful, so there were four checks, and, uh, and again, very, very straightforward. So those, that's the baseline of verbiage we're gonna use. But now we need to talk about the text lifecycle and the execution flow and the different stages in which you can hook it. Because we can't talk about distributed testing if we haven't got that covered. So we're pretty far along, but still we need to crank it up a notch. So this is the more generic way of, of providing you the execution flow. The comments are, are really the magic here. So everything that is defined outside of the scope of these functions is init code. Then you have the setup code, the VU code and the teardown code. Init code is called once per VU. You've seen that before, those HTTP imports and all the other JavaScript imports are executed for every virtual user. The setup function, as you'd expect, is only executed once. It was featured in one of the previous examples. And then, of course, the default function is called once per iteration. So you should be familiar with the concept of an iteration. It's the amount of times a virtual user runs the scenario. And then in the end, you can do teardown code that only gets run once. Okay, fair enough, but how can you use it? Why should you use it? Well, here's an example. I try to be a bit creative with that. So at the, at the init code level, which is called once per VU, we're importing the HTTP object that we need. Then in the setup function, we will fetch a dependency just once. We're calling HTTP bin test k6io slash json, which returns some sort of a random JSON data structure, and we're parsing it. We're doing res.json, which turns it into native JavaScript JSON object. There's this slideshow property, and it has a collection of slides. We take that, we return that as a dependency, and as you've seen before, in your default function, this data argument comes in, dependency injection pattern containing everything that was fetched in JSON format from those slides on the external resource. Then we iterate over it in the VU code. So that gets run once per iteration and calls some sort of a URL slash the slide title and that gets run. And in the end, of course, we need to tear down everything we've done. But since HTTP is stateless, there's not a lot to do or not a lot to close. So the creative way I went along is, hey, maybe we should do a console log and, and, and say hi and specify what has happened. So that is the execution flow. That is how you understand what happens where and where you position things. The next step is to access metrics. You've seen the end of test metrics, but you can actually access metric values from within your code. So what you could do in that execution is when the res gets returned after the HTTP call, you can actually get res.timings and have a collection of timings. So here we're taking the total duration and you can do whatever you want with it. I decided to console log it, so when we run the script, you can see it as it happens. And you don't have to wait until the end of test results get presented. 
This happens for every single call. This is not a summary. This res.timings.duration is only one of many metrics that are available. Here, in terms of timings, you have all those metrics readily available for you. So if one of these matters, you can use them and do whatever you want. Those are standard metrics, timing metrics. Why not create our own? Maybe there's things we want to measure that out of the box K6 doesn't do for us. Here's again an example. So the concept of this example, and I'm well aware if you put text on a slide, people will read the text and stop listening. Still, I will try. So my idea was to do an HTTP call and categorize the HTTP status code ranges, the 200s, the 300s, the 400s, and the 500s. K6 doesn't do that out of the box, so what we did was create new counters. And these counters have relevant names, right? REST 200, REST 300, 400, and 500. Because I can't really trust that the system will have variations in the status code, because how, how on earth are we going to test for failure, I actually synthesized that. So the constant statuses collection is just status codes that I will randomly render. And as you can see, I imported an external library uh, and I took the random item function. And that will, while we iterate 20 times, create a random status code, and then we'll measure. So if, so when we perform this to the random status code, this endpoint, gracefully provided by the people at K6, will return that status code. And if it's between 200 and 300, we add one value to the rest 200 counter. It only increases. And at the end, we will see the result. So the result here, again, this is not representative of anything because it's synthetic, but I just wanted to show you that it's entirely possible. There were four 200s, eight 300s, two 400s, uh, or eight 400s and two 500s. So it, it is a way of defining something. I, I had to be creative in the process, but when I wanted to show you that it's not restricted at counters, you can do much more with it. I showed you a counter, and what the, the main property of a counter is just it increases and increases over time. But you also have gauges that you can define, and that is the last value. So a gauge can go up and a gauge can go down in its value. What K6 does for you is it tracks the minimum and the maximum value and the last one, and that will go up, will go down. You can also define a rate, which just looks at the non-zero values and adds those, that's, that's your rate. And in the end, you also have a trend. You've seen plenty of trends. They contain min, max, average, and the percentiles. You can play around with that and define whatever you need for your testing scenarios. We've talked a lot about end of test metrics and we'll, we'll do for, for a couple of minutes before we dive into something different. So you know this one. This is pretty straightforward. It contains the counters, gauges, rates, and trends. But maybe not everything is, is that relevant for you. Maybe you want to reduce the scope of it. And you can do so, again, with this notorious options data structure. It's, it's something that does a little bit of everything. You can specify a summary trend stats property and just mention the stuff you want. So we're reducing the trends, we're getting the percentiles out of it. And then you can see that the output is a lot more narrow. So you can tailor it to your needs and do what you need to do. Again, uh, the same thing, but not portable, just flexible at runtime. So when you run K6 run, uh, you can state whatever you need. In this case, it's average, min, and max. You can also choose, here's where it gets interesting, to not return any summary. It's like we're doing these tests seemingly blind, with an emphasis on seemingly. Of course, there's more to the story. But there's a lot of situations where you don't want that end of test summary. What you are able to do also, before we dive into the key here, which will get us to distributed testing, is you can store things in different formats, in JSON format, in CSV format. You can process it on standard out, you can write it to a file. But again, that's just happening at the end of the test. Maybe we don't want anything at the end of the test, and maybe we want things to happen in real time. And that's where external integrations and components come into play. The people at Grafana Labs who developed K6 have a bunch of supported integrations where you can send your metrics on the go. This is not a place where you store the end of test metrics, this is where everything gets stored every now and then. And as you can see, the list is quite extensive, but I'm going to be honest, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use Prometheus. Who uses Prometheus? Ah, it's not bad. Uh, well, I like Prometheus because it's quite simple. Now, in order to support Prometheus, we need to recompile K6. 
Because although K6 has native Prometheus support, it's not the right kind. It's not the kind I like. So the approach of, of the people of K6 is Prometheus integrations means we will do HTTP post calls to the Prometheus server every time we log something. The problem with that is every time you, something happens, you need to log it. If a million things happen, a million things get logged. So that means as you're growing the scale of your tests, your Prometheus server needs to catch up and that's turned out to be impossible uh, or, or was unreasonable from our end. Luckily, the community provides something extra. There's this guy called, or lady, I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman, Skiba, and, uh, who provides an XK6 Prometheus contribution. And it does the exact opposite. What it does is it provides a pull strategy where Prometheus actually pulls from your K6 nodes, which is a lot more efficient. Of course, in order to have that component readily available, you need to use XK6. XK6 is a Go component that builds K6 binaries. So just do go install and use that top line and you will have uh, XK6. And with the XK6 build command, you can provide an external dependency and it will compile it in. And in the end, you will have that custom K6 binary. You can do run as you're used to, provide minus O to say where the output has to go and you use the keyword Prometheus and specify a namespace, in this case K6, and the port to expose all of this to. So as long as K6 runs with these parameters, it will be readily available over port 9090 and expose Prometheus-style metrics. That will, can be, just like any other node exporter, can be scraped by Prometheus. So when you would do the curl localhost 9090, this is the stuff that comes out. All of these metrics are available and can be pulled in. Now we need to visualize this because this is not user-friendly. What kind of tool we would use? Any ideas? You can speak out loud. I'm hearing whispers here, probably with the right answer. Grafana, yes, obviously, Grafana. Grafana is a tool we know and like. I'm not sure about the like. We know it, right? We know it. I like it to some extent. It did the job, to be honest, for my little world tour. So what we do then is we run multiple K6s, and that's where we venture into the world of distributed load testing. Maybe in different geographical regions, you put your K6 servers, you give the Prometheus information, specify port 9090, and then you can scrape them all from within your Prometheus server configuration and provide labels that you can filter on later, later on. Pretty interesting. And those labels then give you different variations of the same metric per value of that label. And in our case, that's Ireland and that's the US and eventually also Singapore. So the end result of all of that is while your tests are running in real time, not at the end of the test, you can create these dashboards. And that was really what I wanted to do for my tour. Uh, these aren't super impressive. I mean, I went all the way up to 75 gigs a second on plain uh, Amazon hardware. It's nothing special. Of course, those were expensive. And just a little insight, I think it cost us a thousand euros a day to run those tests. So we, we kept them to a minimum. What you're seeing here is the result of that. You can see that we're running 300 VUs in total, spread across three regions, each with 100 and that the time to first byte is less than a millisecond in Ireland and the US, and Singapore is misbehaving. Of course, this is a, I wouldn't call it synthetic, but the trick to this, to getting these very, very low time to first byte, is that the K6 servers were in the same data center as the varnish servers that we're testing, and we used the internal network, so it didn't go out to the internet, that's why we we got those great results. But what we wanted to show is that we can perform sub-millisecond latency. Of course, it depends on your external networking factors, but that wasn't factored in. And you can also see that we're processing 1.89 gigs a second in Ireland, and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty damn good overview that updates itself every five seconds. So if you have a test that runs for an hour, you can keep the dashboard, and regardless of the number of servers you have, you can get a bird's eye view on the performance. And that is really what I wanted. That was the end result for me. There was some Grafana magic as well. It's not solely about pulling in the information from Prometheus. Sometimes you needed to do some functions like a rate and a sum and some intervals and some variables. So this is what I used to create these dashboards. So now that we have all the things in place and we laid out the groundwork, you're familiar with that, we can really go and take it to the next level and talk about those distributed tests. Here we go. This is what I would advise you to do. Now, the first line that is in red, minus 65, 65, that's optional. Because when you do a K6 run, 
there will be an API readily available. You can do a curl on localhost 6565 and you'll be able to talk to that K6 server. But you can specify any port you want. You can put in on port 8080 or 80 as far as I'm concerned. But what is equally important is to put it in state paused because you don't want those tests to run immediately. You want to stage everything, put everything in place, and then using a single endpoint, maybe a single K6 binary, trigger, unleash the horses, so to speak, from one central location. Maybe we're here in London and we have servers in five different locations across the world. If they're in pause state, uh, are scrapable via Prometheus and have their API readily available on 6565, that's good enough for me. One important factor here is if we want to control the scalability, we need to define a scenario. And this is me getting ahead of things. In the end, we will talk about scenarios and how to configure them. But here we need to set it to externally controlled. And externally controlled allows us to fiddle with the scalability parameters ad hoc, at runtime, without stating it on the command line uh, of the server and without using anything that is defined here. What we do define is the range. So we set the virtual users, we set it to two to start with, and then via the command line you can tweak it, but you can't surpass the 5,000 level. And the test cannot run longer than two hours. That's what we have, and then you start hammering that endpoint. And then it gets fun, right? Here's where you do the distributed stuff. Maybe you're sitting at home and you were triggering something in Ireland. So you do K6 resume, and then you do minus A to specify which server you want to connect to. I'm going to irelandtest.com on 6565. And all of a sudden you get output that the paused state is now false because it's running. And it's running at zero for now. There's zero virtual users. So we need to ramp that up a bit and do the same command, but with scale, K6 scale minus U, set it to 100, and in the end you're done. And you do that on all the other servers as well. You do that in the United States. You do that in Singapore, all from a single location, and all of a sudden all these tests start running, and you have your single dashboard, your Grafana dashboard, that you can look at and see what's going on. That's what I like about this. And that's why I wouldn't call it falling in love with K6, but that's how I started appreciating K6, because of those flexible things, and it, it all works in a pretty easy way. But remember, wrapper, these are all wrappers around an API. Whatever the command line does, and that K6 scale and resume and pause does, is nothing more than sending API calls. And you can do that yourself. If you want to integrate that in your software, in whatever you have, you can actually call ireland.test.com on 6565 and do V1 status, and you have all the JSON output you need to know what's going on. It's the same output that the K6 binary parses and presents to you. And in the same way, you can do an HTTP patch call to the same endpoint and change the parameters and set the VUs to 500. That's the equivalent of doing K6 scale minus U 500. Very nice. And in the end, when you run the command, you will get the JSON output. If you want to, you can even get individual metrics via the HPI call. Again, irelandtest.com, 6565, v1, and then metrics and the name of the metric, which is HTTP request duration, and you can get all the information you need. Very good. All right, let's, let's go to the next one, which is scenarios. So now I probably convinced you, I hope, at the minimum, that using this tool, which is open source, you can perform a level of distributed testing. You can orchestrate using whatever tool you want that there's K6 nodes in different areas and you can control them centrally. But now we need to talk about scenarios. And one of those scenarios, the externally controlled one, will be featured as well. So the scenario parameters vary a bit. So you could define the VUs, the number of iterations, the duration, as you've seen, but also when a specific scenario needs to be executed. It's not like everything happens at the same time. You can plan the execution of this and choose the executor you want. And this brings us back to our little cap theorem, where two out of three are chosen and the one is the variable. So let's set that plan in motion and define some scenarios. Here we're having two scenarios, a shared iterations and a per VU iterations, where we define the initial virtual users, the number of iterations and the start time. So for the first 10 seconds, the shared iterations takes place and then the per VU iterations. And I'll talk about them. I'll explain them what they are, and I'll show you some graphs of the execution and how they perform. What you should know is that there's a bunch of them. You've seen externally controlled, you've seen shared VU and per, v, uh, per VU iterations. You have constant VUs, ramping up, arrival rates as well, 
all that kind of nice stuff. So, so let's do that. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's take one. This is the shared iterations. So you have a bucket of 200 iterations that you want to have. That's what we fix. We also set the virtual users. If you remember our little triangle there, time is variable, but we cap it. We set a timeout to 30 seconds. So every VU, all 10 of them, take work from that iterations stack until it's empty. And this is the execution. Now, I want to make sure, because I had bad experiences with that, can you see the gray on the slide? Is that visible? Yeah, I had scenario of, like situations where I presented where this was white. You couldn't see it. Uh, as a matter of fact, on, on my monitor here, I can't see it, so I have to look in that direction. So what happens is it only takes eight seconds to execute. And the gray actually shows you uh, the virtual users that ramp up all the way to 10, because that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to end up at 10 and then stay there. You can see that the iteration rate varies a bit, but in the end, we want all iterations to be run. So we're trying to, or we're reaching, give or take 20 iterations a second, and we're doing this in eight seconds. That, that's what happens. If we're using per VU iterations, which seem very similar, it's the same kind of work, right? 200 iterations to be done, but in this case, we're dedicating 20 iterations to each VU. And again, we give it 30 seconds. So you might ask yourself the question, how does it perform? And it performs a bit worse. Instead of eight seconds, it took nine seconds. And the lower efficiency is due to idle VUs. Because we're dedicating, we're giving each one of them an equal amount of work, if one of those VUs has the luck of executing faster, it's just sitting there doing nothing, whereas it could be taking another stack or another item from the stack. So keep that in mind that they vary in terms of performance. We also have constant VUs. Again, our little triangle there. We set the VUs to 10, the duration to 30 seconds, so there's an exact execution time of 30 seconds. So the variable, obviously, I could play a game where I ask you, and what is the variable? But you already know that. You know it's iterations. The iterations will vary. And in this case, you can see the ramp up to 10 VUs. You can see the 30 second duration. And in total, there's 600 iterations. That's the variable. That's what we can read from this graph. Ramping up means, we're, because everything has to ramp up, right? You, you can't go from zero to 100 immediately. It needs a little bit of time to spawn all those virtual users. But in this way, you can actually schedule how you do that. You can, ahead of time, say for the first 20 seconds, we're going to go from zero to 10. We will make sure that takes 10 seconds. Once you're at that rate of 10 virtual users, you can go down to zero again, but we'll do that at a more accelerated rate. And in 10 seconds, you have to be all the way down at zero. And there's no graceful ramp down. So when you look at it, you can see stage one ramping up quite a, uh, at a, a decent pace. And when we reach the rate, we go all the way down. And that iteration rate per second uh, actually results from that. Then we need to talk about something else. We need to talk about the arrival rate. And the arrival rate means that you're trying to focus more on iterations per second rather than the individual ones. So what this means is that we're running this for 30 seconds again, but at a rate of 30, an increase of 30 iterations per second. That's what we want. That's what we want to reach. And the virtual users, well, those will vary. We'll start at 2 and we'll end at 50. So what you see here is that the VUs are, are dynamic. They will scale along as, as required. But the iteration rate is fixed. You can see it's a straight line. Nine, so it, there's a total of 900 iterations at a rate of 30 per second. And if you go back to the code, you can see that. 30 uh, seconds will be the execution at 30 per second. Should make sense, right? That should be it. So if you want to see how many iterations per second your system can handle, the arrival rate is what you should be looking at. And then, of course, and that's the last one, is externally controlled. That should be no secret to you. That's pretty much it. I told you it would be less than an hour. We could do 15 more minutes of Q&A. I don't think anyone's really interested in that, I guess. I usually try to dodge Q&A, and the reason why I try to dodge Q&A is because A, people want to get out of here and do other stuff, and B, the questions that people ask are like mostly entirely focused around their specific use case. But still, I can't run away. I still have 15 minutes. If, if you want me to take advantage of that, 
look, the half slides are coming on. I won't be offended if you run off, dash off, and do whatever you need to do. But if you have questions, I think there is a, a microphone light right here. Uh, and if you, you want to ask questions in a more private way, uh, I'll, I'll be around for a couple of minutes. This is the last session of the day, day one of NDC London. You made it. Anyone coming back tomorrow? Great. Enjoy it. Thank you for spending your time with me. I know you have options. There are six rooms. You chose to be with me. I'm very grateful for that.